Uh, anybody here ever missed the point? <laughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I've been married for uh, almost 24 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. And I, I remember early on a pastor said to uh, Fawn and I, um, we had been married probably five or six years, and they said, uh, if I've learned anything, it's that when you get married, you really don't figure out how to have a conversation with each other for 10 years. <laughs> and I thought, well, if that's not the most hopeless thing I've ever heard in my life, thanks a lot. And then we hit the 10-year mark after 10 years of investing in our relationship and marriage, and we looked at each other and said, you know what? I think we're starting to understand each other. <laughs> but I can, I can say over those 10 years and the 12 years since then, the 14 years since then, that I couldn't count how many times I thought we were talking about something that we weren't talking about. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I have passionately made a point that completely missed the point. Anybody else? Is it just me? The Sermon on the Mount, which is where we're returning to today, over and over again, Jesus says, you've heard it said, but now let me tell you what it really was all about. Over and over again, Jesus said, there's something you've been trying to work out, but you missed the point. I don't think that that's a message that any of us don't need to hear. I don't know how you feel as you've watched the last 18 months, two years unfold. It would seem to me that I've seen a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but under the pressure of what the last two years have been, it would seem like maybe somewhere along the lines they missed the point because what's come out of them doesn't look anything like Jesus. I've seen it in my own life. Any of us who experience pressure, pain, disappointment, you, you can start to see that things come out of you that you're not real happy about, and that maybe you didn't even know were there. And what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is he says, I want to get past all of that stuff on the surface, and I want to get to the heart, because when we begin to live from the heart that Jesus has given us empowered by the Holy Spirit, not just the facade on the outside, but the heart transformation that happens on the inside, then when you get squeezed, what comes out of you is not the hidden stuff, it's Jesus. And the world needs to see Jesus today, more than ever before. Let's read beginning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Take out your Bible, your phone. I hope you have something to take notes on. There's going to be lots of scripture in the message today, we won't read all of it, but I'm going to give it to you so you can look at it and see how beautifully and powerfully the story of God is told through the Sermon on the Mount. And specifically, these verses we'll read today, beginning in verse 17. Jesus said, everybody say, Jesus said. Jesus. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Everybody say fulfill. fulfill. The word fulfill in the original language means to fill up, to make complete. He goes on, for truly I say to you until heaven and earth is passed away, not an iota or a dot, a jot or a tittle, like a, the crossing of the T or the dotting of the I will not pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, beginning with uh, four. Next slide. Let's read this out loud together. On your mark, it said go. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that over the next few minutes, you would open the eyes of our hearts to see your word. 
that your spirit would work in us and among us and that whether we're sitting on our couch at home, whether we're in the room today or we listen to this weeks or months down the road, it's not my words that can change us. It's your word and your spirit that at any time, at any point, in any place can open the eyes of our hearts. And I pray that today you would do that in powerful ways in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus talks about the law, the law or the prophets. What is that? Well, the law is what God gave to Moses in order to instruct the nation how to live in covenant relationship with him. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, they were a people that had a history and a heritage, but they had lived a life of slaves now for a long time. And as God brings them out into the desert, to Mount Sinai, to establish them as the people through whom he would tell his story of redemption and salvation through them to the whole world. He brings them to this place and he gives them the law. It's very important to understand that the law does not simply mean a set of rules. The law represents the way to covenant relationship with God. And he brings them to Mount Sinai and he gives them the law to demonstrate how to be righteous or in right standing with God and also how to be distinct and different from all the other nations in the world. And over the scripture, we see that the heart of the law is picked up. We see it in the psalmist in Psalm chapter 19, verse seven. The scripture says, the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. Anybody's soul need to be revived? Anybody? I'll tell you, the law of the Lord is better than an energy drink. (laughs) Psalm chapter one, verses one and two says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Everybody say that, the law of the Lord of the Lord. In it, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, bearing fruit in season. The scripture says when you put the root of your life deep into God's law, you love it and you soak it up. It's like this underground aquifer that when everything else is desolate above ground, you're drawing from a resource that goes deep and doesn't dry up. Now, the law that God gave to Moses consisted of the Big Ten. You heard of those, the Ten Commandments? And then over 600 other commandments that were given to Moses. Several books of the Bible are given. Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers all help to unpack the law after Moses. Joshua becomes the leader of the nation of Israel. And one of the first things that that God says to Joshua is this in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. It's really important to understand that the law was given not to confine people with a set of behaviors or rules. The law was actually given to free people to know how to live in the freedom and the abundance and the life that God had promised to them. Listen, if you haven't figured it out yet, your heart doesn't always tell you the truth. Anybody notice that? Anybody? Has anything ever seemed like a good idea at the time? And then you look back, you know, what, you know what scars are? Scars are reminders that you probably should have thought that through different. And what, what God's instructions give to us is a plumb line or a consistent, steady thing to look to so that when our hearts say one thing, but God's word, God's way says another thing, you can learn to trust that God's word and God's way is always telling you the truth even when your heart is going wonky. Wonky is a Hebrew word (laughs) for off the rails. 
And it happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. In the bigger picture, we have to keep in mind that the law was given to guide and empower the people of God to live. These are two key words here. To live free and distinct. Take a notes, write those two words down. The law was got given to God's people so that they could live free and distinct from the other nations as opposed to what they had experienced in Egypt, which was captivity and assimilation. Listen, that is still the case today. Christians following Jesus will always be on a path to be more free and more distinct from the rest of the world as opposed to going with the flow, which will cause you to end up in captivity and looking like everybody else. God wants you to be different. He wants you to be distinct. And Jesus said, I've come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. What about the prophets? Well, we could sum up the prophets by saying the prophets were the people that God sent whenever his people began to wander off course. The prophets were the people that God said, he, who, who God sent to show up onto the scene and say, hey, God's over here. Stop it. And come back, return, repent, and come back to what God has called you and who God has called you to be. Now, that's, that's a little picture of what the law is that Jesus is describing. Now, the question is, if you were hearing Jesus' commands 2,000 years ago, you might have thought that the law and the prophets was being ideally fulfilled by the religious leaders of the day. You know, in Jesus' time, there were three groups primarily of religious leaders. There were the scribes, the Pharisees, and the zealots. And they kind of all considered them to be the true people of God, and they all had a different emphasis. Now, the Pharisees, in particular, gave their lives to follow the law precisely. In fact, Pharisees would study for decades upon decades uh, sections of the scripture so that they could they could unpack it. In fact, you see remnants of this today. Today, if you go to Israel, there are certain sects of Jews, certain groups of Jews who follow in this line. And if you're in Israel on a Saturday, which is the Shabbat, the Sabbath, there will be special elevators in the hotels and buildings that go floor to floor to floor to floor to floor and then back again because they believe part of honoring the Sabbath is not pressing any button that has electrical connection. That was one of the rules that they derived from trying to obey all the commandments. And so if, if you get, listen, if you're a tourist and you get in that elevator, it's a long day to get to the top floor. Two, three, Four. And it's all the overflow of that. And yet, Jesus does not look to the Pharisees as the example. In fact, Jesus has an accusation against the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 3 through 9, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained for me. He's basic, what Jesus is describing is a way in which the Pharisees would, would use money that God had said should be used to take care of their family. Then they would basically put it into these religious coffers and banks, and then they would profit from that and say, well, no, we're honoring God above our father and mother. And God, Jesus is saying, you, you've completely missed the point. That's why he says in verse nine, this people honors me with their lips. I want you to catch this, listen. But their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Another place in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28, this describes, Jesus describes what's really happening in the lives of these religious leaders who are following all the rules, but they're missing the point. Matthew 23, 27 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. 
so you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's a pretty bad assessment, isn't it? Jesus looks at these religious leaders who are following the rules on the outside, but his accusation is that the point was never that you would just follow the rules on the outside. The point was always that your heart would be transformed, that your motive would be changed from the inside. Nowhere does Jesus diminish obedience. In fact, nowhere does Jesus diminish following the way. But what Jesus does is not to take away from the need for obedience. He elevates it and says God wants obedience, not just in outward appearance. He wants obedience from the heart. Any parents in the room? Would you rather have your children comply because they don't want to be punished or follow your instructions because they trust you and they love you and they know that you want what's best for them? Either way, they ought to do what you say. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, even science can confirm this today. Love has always been a more powerful motivator than fear. God wants your heart, not just your willpower. And this this idea of trusting God from the heart has been the way that God has related to mankind from the very beginning. You see it in the Garden of Eden. God says to Adam and Eve, just trust me and obey me. And if you'll trust me and obey me, you can have all of this. Just, Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but you can have everything else and I'll take care of you, I'll protect you, I'll provide for you. God says, trust me, and along with that trust comes obedience, and God said, I'll I'll, I'll take care of everything that you need if you'll trust me and obey me. He said the same thing to Noah. He said, Noah, I know this may not make sense to you, but if you'll trust me and you'll obey me and you'll build this ark, I'll save you when the flood comes and I'll use you as an agent through which other people will be saved too. He said, the same thing over and over to Abraham. He said, if you'll obey me and trust me, I'll make you a great nation. You'll be blessed and everybody that comes through you and around you will be blessed. He said it to Moses. He said, Moses, listen, if you will obey me and trust me, I'll make you distinct from all the other nations of the earth and I'll protect you, I'll provide for you. Esther was put into a place where she had to trust God but through her trust, a whole nation was saved. And even today, God says this, trust me and obey me, and I will provide for you, I will protect you. God is not simply looking for people to modify their behavior. He desires that you trust him from your inner being, from your conviction, from your heart. He wants you and me to live toward him by faith. Listen to me, please. Being a Christian is about having your heart transformed by the Spirit of God so that you don't just do the right things, but you want to do the right things because he's alive in you. And that message has been consistent throughout the scripture. Write down this, Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34 says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. God all along has intended to awaken your hearts to be transformed and to draw close to him. And yet, generation after generation after generation, they missed the point. And then came Jesus. Everybody say, thank God for Jesus. 
And Jesus comes onto the scene. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 17, the scripture says, this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. In Matthew 26, verse 56, it said, but all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Speaking of Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 9. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scripture because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness about me. If you believed Moses, you'd believe in me, for he wrote of me. Jesus said all throughout the law, it was never just about the law. The law was to teach you, to point you, to direct you to me. And then when Jesus is resurrected from the grave, he comes back and he goes on a walk with some disciples who don't recognize him. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, the scripture says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. Now, I say all that to say this. Not only does Jesus fulfill the law, but listen, this is why it's so good that you read the whole Bible. Because when you read the whole Bible, and in light of Jesus, listen, everything before Jesus is pointing to Jesus, and everything after Jesus is pointing back to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so when you read the scripture in light of Jesus, you begin to realize, oh, this story about Noah isn't just a story of history. It's a story to remind me that Jesus is better than Noah. And if I come into him, he saves me from the flood, whatever comes. That Jesus is better than Moses. That Moses showed up in Egypt and he did battle against the demon powers that the Egyptians worshiped and eventually he led the people across the ocean into a place of freedom. But Jesus is better than Moses because he came and he battled principalities and powers, disarming them, why? So that you could be free. Every story throughout the Old Testament points forward to the person of Jesus. And when you read the scripture, Read the whole thing and remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Say it with me. Remember Jesus. So in all these ways, Christ fulfills the law. And so to the, to the Jew 2,000 years ago, Jesus was saying that you once thought that it was through obedience and compliance to the law that you would have right relationship with God But Jesus is saying, no, now it's through me that Christ plus nothing is the way into right relationship with God the Father. Christ, say it with me, plus nothing. And if you've ever tried Christian sex, S-E, wow, that could sound, that's (laughs) S-E-C-T-S. Cults, if you will. What you find is whether it's a Mormons, Jehovah's Witness. These are not just denominations. These are groups that will take Jesus plus this in order to be in right relationship with God. And listen, we don't reject Jesus, but we reject Jesus plus anything in order to come to the Father. Jesus, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter eight, verse two through four, listen to this carefully. Paul says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, Paul is saying, this is what happened. 
God, Wesley, I'm giving you the law. The problem is the law has no power to change you from the inside out. And so what the law couldn't do because the law gave you direction, but it didn't give you propulsion. It didn't give you power. Jesus comes to not only show you the way, but to set you free from bondage to sin and self and to empower you. That's the inside out transformation that can take place to walk in his ways, which is something that the law could never do. And if you've ever looked at Christians or looked at the Bible and you've said, it, it doesn't seem like I could ever get there from here, the answer to your dilemma is you're right. You can't get from here to there any more than they could have survived the flood without the ark. But because Jesus is better than Noah, he shows up and says, if you will come in to me, I'll do for you what you cannot do for yourself and make a way for real change to take place. If somebody's been really changed, you ought to say amen. amen. <laughs> so my question for you is this. If when I become a Christian, my heart begins to change from the inside out, that's the will of God. That's what Jesus came to do. Then what is wrong with me when my heart doesn't want to do the Jesus-hearted thing? Anybody ever experienced that? Or when, when you became a Christian, did all of a sudden everything in you just immediately lined up with everything that the Bible says is good and right, and you've just walked the straight and narrow every day since you became a Christian? I dare you to raise your hand because... And this is what I wrestle with. What happens? I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. But my heart seems to want to stay angry sometimes. I love Jesus, but my heart seems to want to fulfill sexual desires that don't line up with what God says is good. I love him, but my heart seems to want to stay anxious. My heart seems to want to be selfish with my money. My heart seems to just want to be afraid. My heart seems to want to hold back forgiveness, to stop being patient, to avoid being an authentic, vulnerable community. My heart seems to want to just keep busy and distracted all the time. Is that the real deal for anybody? See, what happens when Jesus makes it so clear that the will of God is for you to be transformed from the inside out, from the heart, and yet there's something in your heart that feels stuck. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, something profound and powerful and dangerous because in it is the answer to the question, why doesn't my heart want to change more right now? And he said this, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Everybody say deny. deny. And take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. See, here's what you can't do. What you can't do is come to Jesus desiring to experience all of the freedom for which Christ has set you free but then hold on with bloody knuckles to the way your life used to be, to the desires that your, your life used to produce, to everything that once was. Loved ones, coming to Jesus is a choice and it is a decision, but it is also a process that the Bible calls sanctification that is coming back over and over and over again to those things that once promised you life, but you now realize aren't really life. And when you come to those things that your heart wants to hold on to, decisions have to be made because a cross has been arrived at, your will and God's will. And listen, being a Christian means being free, but it also means constantly coming back to the cross, denying yourself, taking up his cross, and following 
him time and time and time and time again. See, there are two things God doesn't want you to become. He doesn't want you to become this kind of religious Pharisee that only cares about following the rules. Nor does he want you to become this free-for-all that says, well, Jesus loves me so I can do whatever I want. Both of those are a lie. He wants to captivate your heart, and your responsibility is to keep coming back to the cross, surrendering, repenting, believing, trusting over and over and over. And as you do, he makes you more alive, and his word becomes more powerful within you Every time you trust him, every time you surrender to him, every time you follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's the Christian life. And I've seen it. I don't know if you can think about people in your life who have encountered Jesus and their, their old life just became distasteful. I think about my mentor, my pastor, Pastor, Pastor Bert, Pastor Jan, that when he had an encounter with Jesus, everything that he had once pursued seemed distasteful to him, and he left it all behind to pursue after Jesus. I remember the day when I sat in my room looking at all of the sports memorabilia all around, all the soccer jerseys and posters that I had, how excited I was to go to school and have a scholarship and, and to fulfill the dreams of my parents, everything that I had thought I had wanted to that point in my life. And I'll never forget after God got a hold of my life, coming and sitting on my bed, looking at all those things and getting sick to my stomach because I realized that in my heart, those things had promised me life. And now I realized they weren't life at all. God wants to awaken your heart, he wants you to follow him from the heart that can only come through Jesus. I have to say this, that all of us will at some point encounter wounds, traumas that our lives have experienced, and you'll say, no matter how bad I wanna follow Jesus, I can't get this thing inside of me to line up with what I know it should be wanting. I was talking to a friend the other day and they're going through a very hard time and business and COVID and everything else. And, and I said, how are you really doing? And they told me. And I said, so what, what advice have you been given from people? And, and he said, you know, I've talked to a couple of my Christian friends and they just tell me to pray more. They, they tell me I need to take a Sabbath more. They, they tell me I need to do all these things. And he said, I know. But something's wrong inside. And I think it's important as a church that we realize that we need to walk in obedience, but sometimes you cannot just obey your way into transformation. Sometimes you need help. Sometimes you need somebody to ask the right questions. Sometimes we need counselors. Sometimes we need therapists. Sometimes we need mental health experts who love Jesus and who have a biblical foundation for their counsel, but sometimes we need those people, and it's okay if you're a Christian, and there are times when you need help to get unstuck. Can I get an amen? Yes. But I'll tell you this, you also, no matter how great of a counselor or therapist you may have, you can't do it in isolation. You also need community. You need authentic relationships to walk in the freedom for which Christ has set you free. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says this, My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Alec, would you come back to the platform? Paul unpacks in this two sentences that you can't sum it up to say it's only about your obedience or it's only about the work that God is doing. It is both of those two things in concert that produce a transformed life. 
And you may think, what would that look like? Well, I want you to imagine for a second a community that was full of people who were living free of anger, free of bitterness, free from unforgiveness, free from sexual scandals, free from families breaking apart, free from abandonment and isolation, a community full of generosity, of peace, of love and joy. What do you think the world would say about a community that looked like that? I'll tell you, in the world that we're living in today, the witness of the church to the world has become really marred. And I'm not saying it's fair or it's right, but the reality is, especially if you're with us here in the Pacific Northwest, there are plenty of people who have never picked up a Bible never been in the doors of a church, and the only thing they know about the church is when they see a scandal in the news. And I'm not saying that's a good representation, but I am saying we need to care about our witness. And yet at the same time, the most powerful witness is not just through your activism. Your most powerful witness is also through the transformation that happens in you that people see and experience and recognize is absolutely supernatural. Jesus says in verse 20, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The point is, the Sermon on the Mount does not abolish the law. Jesus fulfills it. And when you wanna walk out the law, then you walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And he doesn't lower the bar. In fact, he says at the end of chapter five, you have to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. How do, we, how do we do that? How does your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, it all comes back. You don't get your righteousness through your works or deeds. Your righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. It's called imputed righteousness. He gives you his righteousness. And when God looks at you and says, let me look at your righteousness meter, it's, it's not a seven or an eight or a nine or a 10. He just sees Jesus. So you can stand before him unashamed and, and totally accepted. But that's the beginning of a life that is transformed day by day by day from the inside out. Here's how I want to challenge you today to be disciples that make disciples. To be the kind of church where people are transformed from the inside out. To love what they ought to love. To walk in the footsteps of Jesus. It's going to have to require a church full of people that are willing to meet somebody who has a sincere desire to follow Jesus, but their life is so undone that they don't know what in the world that's supposed to look like. And they start somewhere at this negative number. And the church that's needed today is not the church that says, when you get your behaviors figured out, we'll accept you and love you. And then you can become a part. What's needed today is the church that says, I'll meet you there and walk with you as that inside out change takes place. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus did? What would that look like? Well, we get a glimpse in Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, we see the picture of the culmination of God's kingdom come. 
and he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And when you live from the heart that Jesus gives you, then you get to experience a taste of that on earth as it is in heaven. And you begin to demonstrate and display that for the world to see. It will always require both trust and obedience to be transformed from the inside out. And as you do that, you will experience the power of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead in you. And I pray that, God, you would make this community a community of people that passionately follow after you, that love your word and your truth, but also will not settle just to be conformed outwardly. We want to be conformed inwardly. And so God, would you open the eyes of our hearts to see where, where we need to take up the cross daily and follow you. God, where there is self-righteousness, selfishness, or even a disregard for the things of God. God, awaken us to those realities so that we would repent and return to you. And through Christ alone, continually be transformed from the inside out. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wanna ask you the simple question. Is, is there a place in your life that you're being reminded of or awakened to that needs to come to the cross, that you need to deny? Not just as a matter of your willpower, but as a matter of trusting and obeying Jesus, that his way, his will is always the best. Don't hold anything back from him today. Give it to him. Surrender it to him. Repent. And then come to Jesus, whose nail-pierced hands will wrap themselves around you to love you, to lift you up, to comfort you, and to empower you to live the life that he's created you to live. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? And let those words settle in your heart as we sing the words to this song. Because you've been made free because of what Jesus has done to make you a part of his family. Isn't that good news today? You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Pat, you're a child of God. Wesley, you're a child of God. Sano, you're a child of God. And you are not a slave, but you've been free to live in the freedom that Christ has made available. So let's sing that together. It is good news that Jesus has made a way to do what you could never do in your own strength. Let's sing that together. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Right through it. Come on. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescue me so I can stay. Child 
That's the promise right there. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowning in perfect Come on, he saved you for a purpose. You rescued me so I could stand. desire and your will. May his life become more alive in us. And God, I pray that the world would see the heart of God as we go from this place, as we go to schools and businesses, into neighborhoods. May, may people see, not Pharisees, we wanted to see Jesus in us and through where we're stuck, God, I pray for those in the room, those listening today that feel stuck, God, I pray you would, you would give them the wisdom, the understanding for that next step towards freedom. And may we be the community that says nobody is left behind, but we, we come to where you are. We walk together towards Jesus and we are transformed daily by the power of his spirit. Now may God bless you and may he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance towards you and give you peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen.